So I'm so pleased to have Neil Shapiro here today. Um, he's had a remarkable television career. Since 2007, he's been CEO of the WNET Group, overseeing the operations of Channel 13, Channel 21, and New Jersey PBS, a combined audience of 9.5 million. He came to PBS after great success in broadcast news at ABC and then NBC, where he ultimately became president of NBC News. He's won numerous prizes for his work, including 32 Emmys and 31 Edward R. Murrow Awards. At WNET, he's expanded arts and local news coverage, as well as educational programming. You've probably seen him on TV introducing programs or maybe asking you for money. Sometimes he shows up in my email. <laughs> now you have a chance to ask him some questions uh, and you can put any questions you have in the Q&A. Neil, thank you so much for joining me at lunch. My pleasure. So, um, so like everybody, I've been binging on TV during the pandemic. And one of the shows I binged on was The Morning Show on Netflix. The network television world that you see there is not a very nice place to put it mildly. And yet you've always struck me as a really nice guy. And I mean that as a complete compliment. And you didn't just survive in that business, you thrived in it for many, many years. How did you do it? Um, well, part was I got, uh... Ultimately, I get to kind of make a world of my own making. So when I ran a show, Dateline NBC, I ran for a long time. And then I had this rule, Dateline, which is I wouldn't hire jerks. Like, I didn't care how good you were. You had to be a good person, too. Um, and that is still lazy. People still talk about that, the no jerk rule. Um, so the answer is, well, it's true. There's a, lot, there's a lot of competitive pressure in TV. And, mo and the morning show to make good drama exaggerates some of that. There's a lot of other things in TV news, which is, which, which is great. Um, there's an excitement to it, and the fun about working as a team. You know, like you, I worked on my college newspaper, and I remember what I, what being a great print reporter is good, but it's kind of lonely. It's you, and it's you against the clock, and maybe you and your typewriter, your computer against the clock. Where TV is much more of a team sport, especially in the old days, pre-pandemic, when you know you had a cameraman, an editor, and correspondent. You were a team. You worked together, um, and there was an excitement to that. And if if you know, I was struck in, in case of natural disaster, there's two lines. There's everybody fleeing the disaster, which is one way, and there are the first responders and the journalists going the other way towards it. Um, and there is a sense of you're on a great adventure, you're doing important work that people are, care about. That's exhilarating. So what was the biggest adjustment for you moving from a commercial network television to public TV, which you know, maybe it suits your temperament better. I don't know. Uh, you know, you think of public television as nicer. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, I mean, in terms of the, I guess the kinds of things you had to think about, because also it, you weren't just moving from one uh, form of uh, broadcasting to another, you were moving from a different kind of job, from yeah. news only to yeah. everything. Yeah. So I, I'll give you a few because there are a lot of them. One of the great things about it was when I was um, in TV news, I would get a pit in my stomach twice a day. In the morning, that's when the overnight ratings came in. And then in the <laughs> afternoon, when the national ratings came in. Um, and while it's true mission counts, it's commercial television. And you get a scorecard every day. Some days it seems uh, incredibly unfair because there's still some question about how accurate the Nielsen's are. But no matter what it is, that's the ultimate scorecard. And in all the years I've been in television, on the commercial side, there may be a handful of times where someone said, don't worry about the ratings. That was really a terrific show. But there were a lot more when they said either for great ratings, that was fantastic, or for bad ratings, what were you thinking? And that happens every day. Um, and if you work in commercial television, you decide, I want to do the best work I can within those confines. Now, within public television, you know what? Though we get ratings, we do the best we can. And if they're not good, we'll figure out how to do better next time. Um, we're much more absorbed about you know, we, we, want to, uh, we want to touch your heart. We want to make you think. That's We want to touch your soul. That's the real measure of what we do. Um, so that's much more um, frees you up in a lot of ways, not just on the news side, but as you said, in all sides to do media you think is important. 
So that's interesting. So say that again, because I love that concept of what is success for you when you see a show and what's failure for you. Right. So I, mean, I think success is really, have we really touched our audience in some fundamental way? Have we opened their eyes? Have we made them think? Have they experienced something? Have we taken them to some place? And in most cases, not all, but in many cases, it's really, I think we're answering uh, commercial failure. We're doing things that, that for various reasons, commercial television doesn't do. And I think we do it differently or better, or sometimes we do it and they don't do it at all. And so that's me, that's is that a good idea? The measure of success, there's still some importance, like we don't want to do something that nobody watches. So we still care who's watching and we still think about how to promote it and how to leverage it and all that. But I think the important thing is, it really is a very much a viewer's first experience. You know, in, in commercial television, it's just the way it is. If it turns out that my bar mitzvah got a great rating, they would run it, whether it was interesting or not, right? Um, because that's what it's about. And, it, it, and so if, if a number of people can, who it gets off the island, right? Or if that's, that's, that drives ratings, that's important. To us, it's gotta be more than that. It's gotta be, right, what, what values are we talking about here? Why are we doing it? And that's an exciting prism to, to look at content through. So um, following up on that, I think for most people, you know, you have this impressive title, CEO of the WNET group, but I think the vast majority of people have no idea what that actually means. You know, I think when you say, oh, I'm a TV producer, people think, oh, yeah, he puts together a TV show somehow. Um, so what is your day like? I mean, you know, I, I think that obviously it includes overseeing all these things, fundraising, if you could just sort of just sort of walk us through uh, a week of Neil Shapiro, not minute by minute, because we'll be here until <laughs> next week, but in general, and then also maybe divide that into before the pandemic and during, yeah. because one of those things you talked about being a team is really different when your team is in different rooms of their houses. Yeah. Yes, very true. So, you know, I think about my job, if you're old enough to remember, like on the Ed Sullivan show, they'd have that guy who would spin all the plates and he had to keep all the plates spinning. That's sort of like my job. There's an awful lot of things that, that I'm responsible for. They're all challenging. They all have to happen. So, you know, about a third of my time is probably spent fundraising. That is, sometimes you see me on TV with the 800 number across my chest. There's some of those. There's some of representing the station with foundations, some with cultivating uh, our, our donors some meeting new donors and talking about what we're doing. So that's about a third of my time. A third of my time is on content. And that is, um, in some ways, I'm different than a lot of people in public television. A lot of people came up through the development side. As you know, I came up through content. Um, and I think that's something that's helped me because when I talk to people, they know they're talking to someone who's really going to be focused on how we're going to use their money. And um, so that's everything from developing new shows and how we do it and what we could do and what we could not do. And I can talk more about that later. Um, and then the other third is uh, just actually running the station. We have more than 400 people. We have a big building, or it's the building, there's nobody in it at the moment, but we have a building on 50th and 8th. We have another um, uh, office in New Jersey. We have an office on Long Island. Um, and all the things have just come about how to run a big company. Now, the pandemic, I think, has changed things for every CEO. For me, it's changed in a lot of ways. Part of what I liked about television, back to the notion of teamwork, is getting people together and kind of brainstorming. And you could just walk down the hallway and say, come here, let's talk about this. Now, as you know, in this meeting we're in right now, that is really hard. So I find that doing anything that I did before is easy, but anything new takes 5X, 6X, 6X effort than it used to. Um, and even when you get people together, it is very hard in this medium to create. There's something exciting about um, getting people in the same room. And what I loved about, about television, another thing is that, you know, when I was in uh, print and I would write a story, it was kind of as good as, you know, it was kind of limited by what I thought my idea was. And maybe an editor gave me a thought, but that was kind of what it was. In my whole career, there have been times where I sort of had an idea and said to somebody, what do you think about this? And then the, you know, the producer said, that's good, but you could do this. And then the camera person said, no, no, no. And we could shoot it like this. And the editor said, well, we could add this. And the correspondent said, I can add this. And by the time you get done, it's so much better than your, you know, much more modest idea. That is much harder to do in this environment we're in right now, uh, especially for creative work. I think it really is much more difficult. Uh, and the other thing, which, which is just implementing the work, even with, uh, with iPhones and so forth, it was, it was easier to get out and do things without 
COVID protocols, um, you know, and a lot of things we do, we do arts programs, we've had to put the orchestra, you know, six feet apart and try to shoot it differently to try to mitigate that. So there's a whole new way of doing things, which complicates everything. So I'd say, um, and I know everybody's, many people are working harder in the pandemic. I'm working much harder in the pandemic, I think for all those reasons. Thank you. So I did get a message in the chats reminding me that the morning show is actually on Apple TV, not Netflix, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> correction. Um, but having said that it's so much more difficult during the pandemic, what is, just off the top of your head, what is the thing you're proudest of accomplishing during the pandemic? So I'm, I'm incredibly proud of, of my workforce because we, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of businesses had to pivot, but pivoting a TV station is, is I mean, it's so hard that before the pandemic, we did a uh, uh, survey of our employees to see what they wanted and talk about the office rent. And our office was renovated about 10 years ago and it was one of those first kind of open office areas, but it has like a lot of sort of workstations in it, right? And, the, and they said, we hate those. We want a more open place where we can sit and we can collaborate. Like, uh, you know, we want to feel like um, Central Perk on Friends. We want couches. We want to take our laptops around. That's what we want. So I said to the architects who helped us do this, how can I do that? And they said, well, you know, you're going to have to have 40% of your workforce stay home. I said, I'm never going to get to a point where 40% of my workforce can stay home. Well, now I have 100% of my workforce staying home. Um, not that, and many of them are not happy about that. So, but I want to answer your question, what I'm so happy about, especially for the local programs we do, that people found a way to do them and have to gone to extraordinary efforts from not just, you know, turning their living rooms and dining rooms and, into newsrooms, um, but people learning how to multitask, people have, learning how to light themselves, how to shoot things on their phone, people teaching each other new skills. Um, because at the end of the day, the audience, it should, it's not your headache to worry about how we get you the information, it's our headache. Um, but having said that, what you want is make sure we provide stuff which is important, compelling. Um, so I'm, I'm incredibly proud of that. The only thing I'm really proud of is the stuff we've done on non-broadcast on education. So when schools closed, we reached out, we worked with teachers unions, and we had teachers teaching like this into their, into their Zoom phones. We then put editors together and we made hours out of it. Um, and we blow up our regular daytime schedule. So we had we had kind of elementary school classes, we had middle school classes, we had high school classes. Um, and it was as if we'd sprung up like 80 to 90 classrooms like overnight. And I got all this incredible feedback from, especially from parents about, you know, I, my, it was a foundation for my kids. And that did remind me that those are the type of things that public media really does do well. Uh, that is our, that's what we do is what commercial TV would not do. And you really felt like we were stepping up in a big way. That's great. And thank you for that. Because one of the things I think we often forget during the pandemic, everybody is so busy talking about how terrible this is and terrible that is. But the truth is so many people um, have worked so hard to bring us some modicum of normal. So we're going to talk more about um, the, the public television world in a few minutes. But I did want to ask you, um, how did you decide to go into the news business? Uh, was there a person? Was there a TV show? What was your influence that led you down this path? So the quick story is I knew I wanted to be a journalist in some way. And I really thought in the beginning I wanted to be a sports journalist. So like around like pay eight or nine, I taught myself how to type and I would come home every night and I would write a sports column like just for me. Um, and I think my parents are kind of terrified that I would pursue that. They thought it was kind of a crazy <laughs> thing. Um, but it's also, you know, writing is writing and, and talking to people and hearing their stories is fun. And then for me, a galvanizing thing was Watergate, which happened when I was in high school. And I remember the, the hearings were on in the library and I, would, I couldn't tear myself away from that. First, the, the drama of what was happening with the Republic at stake, but also the fact that these two reporters kind of found the story that otherwise what would have been a, could have been a routine break in. And turned out to be, you know, and had it gone forth, had it succeeded, a true threat to our constitution. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to do that. Um, so that started me on the road of print journalism, um, which I did in high school and I did in college. And then I got a job at ABC News um, as sort of a one-year trial, sort of a guy Friday to my boss who said, I'll, you, I'll move you around. You're my research assistant. And your job at the end of the year is to see if anybody else will hire you. Um, and I sort of stuck at ABC and that was, that's how I, that was my TV career. 
That's great. Thank you. So um, we're going to talk more, I promise. Some questions are coming into the Q&A. Um, but we are at the American Jewish Historical Society. And part of the mission of this organization is to explore the diversity of the American Jewish experience. I mean, you know, the old expression you ask, how many people do we have here? 85 people. What does it mean to have a Jewish experience? We'll get what, 170 <laughs> answers? Right. Um, so what what role has being Jewish played in your life and in your work, I might add? Well, I think both. I think, you know, the two things that I think that are about Judaism and about journalism, one is curiosity, right? Judaism is a is all about glorifying questions, right? And at the youngest age, it's okay, it's okay to ask, it's fine to keep asking, even if you don't get answers or get the same answers. And the other thing is, I think, tikkun olam, I think we all try to repair the world. And I believe journalism at its best does that. It gives people the tools to make decisions about their lives, it helps them get information that they need. It's a noble calling. Um, and then I guess ultimately, and one more thing, which I think is you know, Judaism is about storytelling, right? It's an oral tradition. It's best stories are told that way. They are stories that illustrate something larger, right? When you're a kid, you don't often, you understand some dimensions when you get older, right? And you and you hear about the rabbis talking about a story that you heard at six and raise a lot more dimensions to it. That's what great storytelling does in any genre. It's what good storytelling should do in journalism, right? It shouldn't just be, even when we would try to do stories about, you know, crime, and I did a lot of them, or, or I mean, I'll give one example. I remember doing O.J. Simpson. I was at uh, I was at uh, Dateline, and we covered O.J. a lot. Um, and a lot of journalists said that's wrong, right? It's a tawdry story. You shouldn't be covering it. I said no. At first, it's a compelling story, so you can't walk away from the news. But what you should do is try to explore larger issues within O.J. O.J. was not just about a murder. It was about race in America. It was about the police. It was about criminal procedure. It was about a lot of different things. And if you could find your way into those areas while still keeping people hooked to a narrative, you were doing good work. Oh, thank you. Um, so in this vein, your, mm -hmm. uh, your wife, Juju Chang, is the co-anchor of ABC's Nightline. Mm -hmm. So you guys have crazy lives, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, very high pressure careers, highly visible careers. And you have three sons. Um, how, how do you balance that? Well, I married the right woman, so that was... <laughs> Good answer. That's, 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 that's true. But I think that for us, I think being in the same profession has been a huge advantage because we get it. Like things change on a dime. That's the world we cover. That's where we live in. So there's never any anger or vitriol because plans change. They just do, right? And that, and that I think also being a journalist, especially TV journalists, you have to be flexible. Whatever your plans are, they can also change too. So we're good about doing that. Um, and then I think, you know, we love our boys. I'd say my wife has done a, a great job taking my kids on some of her stories. So my kids have met like Jane Fonda and Ryan O'Neill and all kinds of things that I think they never quite get how cool it was that they were seven or eight or nine and they're meeting these famous people. Um, but I think we do try to, without making them watch everything we do, um, I think they take pride in what their parents do. Um, and I think, so I think that helps to understand when suddenly mom can't be there for this or dad misses that, they get it. It's for an, impor it's a, for an important reason. So um, I, I'm a little obsessed with your family because I think it's pretty <laughs> interesting that, um, you know, we live in an age when every aspect of identity is under the microscope. And no matter what you say, it's the wrong thing. Um, and Juju, who's an immigrant from Korea, mm -hmm. uh, converted to Judaism, but after you got married, not the yeah. usual path of, oh, I'm yeah. converting to, um, could you just talk a little bit of, because the, you know, this was a number of years ago, right? Because yeah. if your oldest son's 21, we're talking yeah. at least in the 90s. Yeah. So what was that like for your two families? Uh, were they just completely happy about this or what, what was that conversation like and how did you guys work through all these things? And then why did she, I mean, it's obviously a question for her, but I bet, you know, uh, what made her finally decide to make that shift? So when we um, first started dating, neither of our parents were happy about this. Um, my parents, at least my dad felt like uh, 
I'm just worried about having kids of a mixed marriage in a world where, you know, there's a lot of hate and it's going to, it's unfair to your kids to do this. And you should think long and hard about it. Um, her dad, um, uh, I would say is one of those Koreans who was kind of often very anti-Semitic, even though he didn't really know many Jewish people. And when she moved to New York, he said, be careful, the Jews that are everywhere. So she engaged the enemy. Um, but over time, uh, my parents, Adore, grew to adore Juju. And my father would say, you know, if I had known how great she was, I would have gone to Korea and brought her back myself. So they were great. And Juju's dad over time really also got to, you know, I think saw how well we were together and loved his grandkids and said how proud he was that, um, you know, that he had a Jewish American as a son-in-law. So that, so, but when we were first dating, Juju said like, I grew up sort of agnostic and I really don't believe in God. And I said, that's all fine, but I do, and I have a faith that's important to me. So if we ever got married, I would want to make sure our kids are raised as Jews. And she said, that's fine with me. And I would still, we would, you know, do all the holidays together, even while we were dating, you know, she would do all that. We would do seders and all those things. Um, and then when she was pregnant with our first son, we were having dinner one night and, uh, and she said, I think I'm going to convert. I was like, what? Well, <laughs> I just, I don't want to raise someone in a faith I don't, that I don't believe in. And I have really become um, incredibly comfortable and inspired by this. So I want to convert. And it was a great thing because we did it together. And when you went to those conversion classes, maybe all couples do this, but on the walk home, you would have longer conversations about what values we think are important. How do we think about life and death? How, you know, those kind of essential things that you, uh, you think about in your future, all prompted by the things you were learning. So it was, uh, I mean, we're, it was a great experience for, uh, for, uh, for all, for both of us. Thank you. That, that's fascinating. And thank you very much. So I'm, before I move on to the rest of my questions, we are getting questions in from the audience uh, from Jay Polevsky. Uh, he asks, he says, public television used to be my go place for quality programming. Today, with all the great streaming options, there are many more choices. What is your view of this change? And what adjustments are you making to remain competitive in this environment? Um, well, it is true that we have um, much more competition in, in this explosion of content. Um, there are sort of a couple things we try to do. First, we're trying to find some content which is, just belongs to us. You know, and if you can find the next Downton Abbey or something and exploit it, that's all great. And there's sub partners. Um, that we have relationships with. But we're also looking at things, two things. Uh, first, we have our own, you know, uh, this thing called Passport, which is our version of Netflix. And if you're a member of it, if you join the station, you can take your own deep dive, deep dive into our archives and find a lot of great programs, especially old, older programs, which are great. And then there are things we do, which I would say nobody does, even in the world of streaming. Um, nobody really is going to take a deep dive into, uh, into nature or into history or even into, into sort of arts and high-end arts and culture, um, and certainly not local arts and culture. Um, they're not gonna take a deep dive into local news. So I think there are a lot of things that we can do that we can still take advantage of, giving people time to say what they wanna do, um, letting people, open, finding new artists and open, oh, giving people new paths of expression, finding things that are still sort of ignored by commercial television, and then expanding, we're not just on TV anymore. So we have, we have Passport, we have a huge digital uh, uh, effort and PBS is the number one or number two most used, um, if, you, if you don't count uh, gambling and pornography, PBS is number one or two for uh, websites most used. Um, and I think that there's something about, as, as great as it is to watch Netflix or Apple, or whatever it is, and I watch some of them too, you don't really feel like you're helping anybody else, right? Because everybody else has to pay for those same things. When you especially contribute to public television, you're providing something for free. And I can't tell you how many times there are people who write me notes saying, lost my job, have a hard time making ends meet, can't afford cable. All I have is channel 13 or channel 21. All I have is public television. And I can't tell you what it means to me, right? And I've heard stories from people who said, we grew up and that's all we had. And to, I found my calling. I'm in arts, and, I'm in arts now because I, I watch great performances. I was live, I was in the front row at Live at Lincoln Center. Um, so there are things which I think there's a nobility, there's a social value to what we do. Um, that, I mean, I, I, I got a note the other day from someone who said I'm legally blind and I haven't left the house, but I watched a series you did theater close up and it was like, I put my face close to the screen and it was like I was back in the theater again. 
Wow. I'm, I'm curious, following up on that, do you have any idea, I'm sure you track this, what your demographics are? Does it skew older on public television? And is it, how do you reach out to younger people? Which is, I'm sure, a question for all uh, network news programs, especially but across the board. Yeah. So public television skews a little bit, but not a lot of it older than commercial television. So a little bit older, but not a lot. Um, on TV. Um, on the streaming platforms, it's, you know, so, you know, it, it's, late 50s, early 60s on television, the streaming platforms are in their 40s. So there's a whole nother generation which is finding yeah. things that way. Um, and then we do very well on sort of zero to six, where you know, in that age group we do especially right. well, um, both on air and, and streaming. Um, and I think part of it, as we think about new and different ways to get people, um, part of it is taking advantage of the digital world. So we launched a new thing called All Arts. It's a 24 seven arts and cultural digital channel. And it has the best of PBS. It has a lot of great performances. It has things from our archives. It has a lot of new things and international things. And that is a little bit younger than our television audience. And there's a digital arm for all arts. And that's like in its 20s and 30s. Much smaller little bits of content, you know, new emerging artists. And that's a whole new generation of people who are finding that. The one thing I think about is that there's brand equity in WNET and 13 and 21 and PBS. And part of the new world we live in of this explosion of content is people are gonna look for trusted brands. And there's still people who find like, I, I was looking for something and I started watching the show called Frontline and I discovered how great it is and now I'm watching it. And I still think there will be people who will do that, younger people who will find their way to our material. Great, thank you. So um, Eva Heinemann asks, how do you choose the movies for Saturday night? I love the way you <laughs> edited together when promoting it. And I always look forward to your intro as much as the movies. Oh, thank you. Well, so the stories, the movies themselves are done in a package. All the public television stations put money in and they buy them from the studios. So we have a little bit of say, we get to vote a little bit, but it's really what the packages get to do. The promos you get to see, those are actually among those fun things I do. Is it's my chance to act with Humphrey Bogart and John Wayne and Marlene and <laughs> whoever is cutting them together. Now I'm a bit of a, a movie fan. Um, I don't know as much as you do, but I know a little bit. And sometimes some of the, I know the movie so well, I go, here's what I, I Casablanca one thing, Bogart's gonna say this, I'm gonna say this, you know, Ingrid Brings gonna say this, I'm gonna say this. Um, and that's really fun. That sounds like fun. Um, so somebody asked a question and I, I wanna expand it a little bit. Uh, Nancy Brenner says, there are so many news stories emerging from the Holocaust. And their survive and people's survival paths. Um, will we see more of this on PBS? And I guess that goes back to an earlier question I had, which is the balance. How do you decide what to put on and what not to? And you know, with, with uh, so how do you? You're in the New York area as your primary audience. Um, how, how do you do deal with a subject like the Holocaust in terms of promoting new kinds of programming? Um, so A, we do care a lot about the Holocaust um, in part because it's an important event and in part because we're losing witnesses to talk about it. And in part, as you say, because we serve an audience that has a lot of um, Jewish audience and non-Jewish audience who find that who are very interested in the topic. It's of such interest to us that we have launched, we have a couple of vertical things, which is areas we, we concentrate. And one is called exploring hate about anti-Semitism and racism and extremism. Um, and so we're constantly looking at, at programs, a lot of which are about the Holocaust. What we try to do now is to say, can we find something that isn't, it's a, was a, little, a little bit different. What's unique about this particular show? Now it can be unique because there's stories you've never heard before. It could be unique. We're working on some now, which are about kind of um, in America, who knew, what, what did they know? When did they know it? Um, it could be about a different way to tell the story. Um, it could be about, you know, uh, different angles of it. So we're always interested in exploring the Holocaust, the challenge to try to make sure it's not just the same, but sad to say, there are so many compelling and tragic stories in it. Um, it's just trying to make sure you're disciplined enough to say, I don't want this to feel like the last thing I saw, I want it to feel different. Well, I have to thank you personally. I am actually at this moment in Boston visiting my mother who is a Holocaust survivor who's watching today. She's 99 years old. So uh, thank you for still paying attention to this period of, of history um, and keeping it alive. Um, 
This is a great question because I think it's one of those technical things that people really don't understand so much. What is the relationship between PBS and local public TV stations? So PBS is the public broadcasting service, not the public broadcasting system. That's important because every station is owned and operated locally. Could be owned in our case by you, the people, or a community organization. Sometimes it's owned by a university, um, sometimes a school district. But each, so stations can make many of their own decisions. Um, PBS has something to say about it. There's something called Common Carriage, and they try to keep some of the same shows on at the same time. Right? Some nature, great performances will always be on at the same time. But if you go around the country, sometimes you'll find, what are they doing? Um, it's, it's based on every, every station pays dues to PBS based on the size of your population and a very intricate formula. And then you get programs back from PBS. And PBS is the main source of programming, but not all. A lot of stations do local programming. A lot of things like the movies we acquire from other services. Um, so the, the person who runs PBS, whose name is Paula Kerger, who is an alum of WNET, it's a little bit like herding cats. Like there is a lot of, and it's especially difficult now. We talked about all these new things like passport and so forth. What's the path to the future? Getting every station to, to pay attention to that and to think about it is difficult. Um, it would be easier if we were in this one respect, if we were just all owned by NBC and NBC said, here's how you're doing it, right? We would be more efficient in some ways, but we wouldn't be as rich in terms of getting local character into our programs and really having different stations bring different skills and viewpoints to the whole system. Thank you so much. So the next question that's come up from the audience is, I think a very Jewish question <laughs> and an important question. Uh, is repairing the world a fool's errand because of human nature? Uh, you know, uh, I think it. Right, I think it's true. The, the 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 moral arc of the the long moral arc of the universe bends in a positive direction, but it's slow. So we we retreat. We make progress and we retreat. But you know, in my lifetime, you know, I was um, I grew when I went to college. I studied a lot about the Soviet Union because I believe that the long twilight struggle would be between the United States and the Soviet Union and between capitalism and communism. And then when I was um, 28, I was in Berlin the night the Berlin Wall fell. Now, it's no doubt that Putin is still a threat, but not nearly what the Soviet Union once was. We have made huge progress. We ebbs and flows. Democracy is in a weaker state now than it has been, but we just did a whole show about preserving democracy. And while there are huge issues, there's no doubt we are better now than we were in 1960 or 1860. Right? So I do think I do think we can make progress, and I just not. I don't want to live in a world where it's a fool's errand. I want to live in a world where we're all people. I think there's a basic goodness in most people, and and um, and I believe what I love about Jesus is that we all have an obligation to do our part, whatever it is, to try to make the world better. So, following up on that. You know, you've lived through a lot of difficult times in the world, as have I. Uh, the last couple of years have really been a huge test for so many people, professionally, personally. Um, in the way you do your work, the attitude you express, you see a very strong moral component to it. Where do you go? Where do you go to reinforce that? moral core and mm. to keep it strong and to protect it from the world's efforts to destroy it. Um, you know is what? it in books? Is it a person? Is it where or where? many places? Well, I, I, look, I think it's a lot of these. If you're looking for it, you can find those debates about it. But when I was back to my wife, when she was thinking about converting, she said, you know, I grew up with a very tough father, right? And so we used to figure out how we were going to deceive dad to try to get out and do things, some good, some bad. Um, so she said, when I had issues, um, you know, they're not, they were often not black and white to me and they are to you. And I said, I think that's part about my faith. I just think things are, sometimes they're right or they're wrong. And even though they might be fun to do, they're wrong. And that was part of her appeal about Judaism, that notion that it was a, a moral guide, a moral compass, and it still is for me. So it, it is within Judaism that you find these things, or is it a is it a 
rabbi? Is it a... Uh, I, I love that uh, we're members of Rota Shalom. I love the synagogue. I love the clergy. Um, I find that, that um, you know, many of their sermons um, are, are compelling because they're, they're making you think about stories that you once knew and thinking about them differently, making you think about your obligation to things. Um, and that's, it's great to have someone remind you of that and come at it in a different way. So I do find that's incredibly helpful to me. Thank you so much. Um, somebody has asked, what about entertainment law has been important to your career and how have you learned it? Uh, he says, libel law, intellectual property, me too. Um, the whole gamut. Yeah. So part of it, you know, I learned early on in my journalism career that one of the most important things you can do is, is uh, have a lawyer at your side. So a lot of this I learned doing stories and the bigger stories we did, especially magazine stories, which were important and incredibly litigious, um, to have lawyers there was incredibly helpful. And, uh, and I learned a lot about sort of, I was like, I want to, I don't want to go, I want to go as close to the line as I can without going over it. And good lawyers would help you understand what you, what you can say, what you can't say. Oftentimes, um, what I, I would sometimes work with, I would say to other journalists I work with who would talk about being a journalist like they were a prosecutor. Like, I'm going to get this person, I'm going to do that. And I say, that is a big mistake. It's a big mistake because actually that's not your job. Your job is to find out whatever the truth is, and you should be open to the fact that you're wrong. And second, if you ever go to courtroom, you don't want to be able to say, I came in with a predetermined point of view. So I, you know, I learned a lot about that, and especially when I did a lot of investigative reporting. Uh, but as to all the other things, and, and now in my life at, at um, WNET, we're constantly talking about both products, things we shoot ourselves, other things understanding rights, which is a, are incredibly important in products we shoot, things we acquire, how complicated they are, how they're changing. Um, so I've learned a lot from lawyers going forward. And I've also learned that's going to keep changing. You know, the more content there is, the more different platforms there are. Um, and I think it's everybody's going to have to be flexible about it. You know, it will be, it will be to the detriment. And I, I think some of the very established cultural institutions in New York are starting to become flexible because they're realizing they can't just live in a world where you pay enormous prices for something where it's only shown four times and that's it, or you limit your, where people can see perhaps only in-person productions and that's it. That's not the world we live in. And I think we're all gonna have to figure out how to take part in that. Thank you. Um, so uh, we're getting, oh, we got our friendly five minute warning. So I've, Many more questions to ask, but um, well, before we go, I have been wondering about your suspenders. <laughs> Neil, for those of you who don't realize, it has an incredible, incredible array of superhero suspenders, dancer suspenders. Um, have you always done that? Is that your signature? What? How did you get started on that? So so my wife gave me a pair of suspenders once and I wore them and people around the office liked them, especially the women around the office liked them. So I said, oh, I should wear more of these things. Then when I came over to, and I, so I had about, uh, I didn't wear it all the time, but I wore it a lot. Then when I came to um, Channel 13, I went on the air and I, and I tried, went, you'll know the pandemic's over because I'm going to start wearing them on the air again when we get back to the office. I have my little message to you that we're back. Uh, but I did it because I wanted some way to be recognized. And my predecessor, Bill Baker, wore a necktie or a bow tie. Uh, and I, I can't really tie bow ties. And so that can't be my thing. But I said I could wear suspenders. And that time, like Larry King and I were the only two people on television wearing suspenders. And then he wasn't on television anymore. And as you said, it became a thing like, oh, you're the guy with suspenders. Um, but now I've reached a point like, like movie posters where my wife said, that's it. Like now, no more. So now it's a, it's a, um, I have like a hundred of them. So if I get new ones, I have to discard some old ones. You have a hundred of them? Yeah. yeah. And, and well, that is astonishing to <laughs> me. So like before you make an appearance on TV, you decide what matches the thing that you're going to be talking about. Like, like, yeah, like the movie ones I have. If you see me back on movies, it's, it's the leader. It's like 876543 was in the, in the movie thing. And sometimes I do arts things and I try to match the theme. Sometimes it's just a color thing, but it's also trying to match your pocket square and your tie and your suspenders. That used to take a lot of time. Now I've got that time back, but I look forward to getting back into that game. Well, we look forward to you getting 
back in that game as well. And there's actually another suspender question. Did you ever call your suspender braces? Braces, yeah. Do you wear and do you wear a belt and suspenders? No, I don't. I just I wear one or the other. I'm daring that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think on that note. <laughs> Thank you so much, Neil. This has been so informative, so enlightening. Really appreciate your time. It was my pleasure. Thanks for the questions and thanks everybody for watching.